liverwurst, liver and onions, liver pate. Unless you're a real gourmet with a taste for foie gras, liver just isn't the most popular thing on the menu. On the other hand, most of us are aware that too much alcohol can harm our liver and that hepatitis is no one's idea of a good time. What you may not know is that the liver is the primary organ that allows us to survive exposure to the thousands of chemical compounds in the foods and beverages we eat every day. Think about it. When we decide to eat edamame or scrambled eggs or peanut butter and jelly sandwich, our body has no way of knowing exactly what types of chemical compounds are on the way or in what dose. When you drink coffee, your body can't know whether you've just ordered a double shot of espresso or a decaf latte. Whether you're a vegan or a carnivore, a junk food junkie or a health food fanatic, your daily diet consists of a complex cocktail of many chemical compounds that include macro and micronutrients, flavors, pigments, additives, and other compounds. This is why it's a bit strange to hear someone say that they don't want any chemicals in their food. That's what food is, a bunch of chemicals. Each chemical compound we are exposed to may or may not be toxic based on the dose being consumed and how it interacts with other compounds. According to the Canadian Institutes of Health, over 114,000 metabolites have been identified in blood and urine. These metabolites result from the foods we eat, the beverages we consume, the medicines we take, the air we breathe, and the metabolites our own bodies produce from all of those. Of those 114,000 compounds, estimates are that 25,000 of those are food-related. This means that the systems that prevent any one of these chemical compounds from reaching toxic levels must be prepared for almost anything. And now, for a bit of mildly disgusting physiology. From mouth to anus, our digestive tract can be thought of as a tube. What is inside that tube is not truly inside our bodies until it enters our bloodstream. With a few notable exceptions, such as water and glucose, most of the foods we eat or drink remain in our digestive tract until they reach the small intestine. Most nutrients are absorbed there. Fiber is partly converted to usable energy in the large intestine. Some materials, such as whole corn kernels, pass through without being absorbed at all. In order to cross the intestinal barrier, compounds must passively diffuse or be actively transported. Fat-soluble materials must be packaged into my cells. Some materials make it inside intestinal cells only to be returned right back into the intestine. Only those compounds that cross all of these hurdles can truly get inside the body. After crossing the wall of the intestinal cells, water-soluble compounds are transported by small blood vessels to the portal vein. Fat-soluble compounds are first absorbed into lymphatic vessels and then move into the portal vein. From the portal vein, all roads lead to the liver. The liver itself is a large, spongy, blood-filled organ, roughly divided into four parts, or lobes, with an incredible range of functions, including the synthesis of fatty acids, cholesterol and hormones, and most important to this discussion, the detoxification and excretion of a myriad of chemical compounds from food and other sources. The four lobes of the liver are subdivided into a honeycomb-like assembly of hexagon-shaped subunits called lobules. Within each lobule, blood from the portal vein mixes with oxygen-rich blood from the lungs and bathes channels lined with liver cells. Bile flows through a second set of channels, but in the opposite direction. This countercurrent flow pattern, with bile found in each lobule, assures the greatest possible exposure of blood metabolites to the detoxifying enzymes of the liver. Whether it is a toxicant or a toxin, any material that has made its way inside the body may be considered a xenobiotic, indicating that it is from the outside. Xenobiotic metabolism is a general term used to describe how our body detoxifies these outside materials and prepares them for excretion. While the term xenobiotic is typically reserved for non-nutrients, even essential nutrients must be metabolized and eventually excreted so they do not build up to toxic levels. One notable example of this is the vitamin A poisoning that resulted when Arctic explorers consumed polar bear liver. 
these large animals concentrate vitamin A in their liver to such a degree that eating it could be fatal. Suffice it to say that vitamin or not, the dose makes the poison. There are two general phases of xenobiotic metabolism, appropriately titled phase one and phase two. Both phases are driven by systems of enzymes. Phase one enzymes are primarily designed to oxidize fat soluble compounds to increase their water solubility and to prepare them for further metabolism by phase two enzymes. Since the body is primarily made up of water, making compounds more water soluble facilitates xenobiotic transport and elimination. By far the most well-known family of phase one enzymes are the cytochrome P450s. Cytochrome P450s, or SIPs, get their name from the fact that they absorb light at 450 nanometers in the presence of carbon monoxide. SIPs are iron-containing, oxidizing enzymes that generally serve to add a water-loving OH group to chemical compounds. They are found in two places within cells, the protein processing endoplasmic reticulum and the energy producing mitochondria. SIP enzymes are particularly concentrated in the liver. According to the National Institutes of Health, there are over 60 genes coding for human SIP enzymes. Particular SIPs are classified using numbers and letters, such as SIP1A1, in order to designate subfamily and particular enzyme types. SIP metabolism in the liver is responsible for about three quarters of the xenobiotic metabolism that occurs in our bodies. Phase two enzymes are designed to make the products of phase one enzymes even more polar and to attach signal molecules to flag the now more water soluble xenobiotics for elimination in bile or urine. In some cases, highly water soluble compounds may be metabolized by phase two enzymes without phase one metabolism. The liver is not alone in its efforts to detoxify and excrete xenobiotics. While phase one and phase two xenobiotic metabolizing enzymes are concentrated in the liver, they are distributed throughout the body. The kidneys play a key role in ridding the body of potential toxins via urine. Because they are so vital to the metabolism and excretion of xenobiotics, the liver and kidneys are often the first organs to be affected by food-based toxins and toxicants. So far, we've learned that we are exposed to many thousands of chemical compounds each day and that our liver has an amazing architecture that allows phase one and phase two enzymes to metabolize these compounds and prepare them for excretion. In Xenobiotic Metabolism Part 2, we'll learn about how genetic variation interacts with the foods we eat to determine how well xenobiotic metabolism works.